honorarium that we have of the award, and then we'll induce, or introduce our um, 2023 per, Perlene awardee, Dr. Yinling Wu. So now, Franklin, please take it away. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Franklin Huang, and I'm an associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and the co-founder of the nonprofit organization Global Oncology. Uh, this morning, it is my distinct honor to present the 2023 Rachel Perlin Global Cancer Award to Dr. Yinling Wu. This morning, I would also like to begin by recognizing the Perlin family, Don, Rachel's father, and Sarah, Rachel's beloved sister, who are joining us today as well. Rachel was incredibly close to her father and sister, and we deeply appreciate the support of this award. Rachel and I grew up together in St. Louis, Missouri, and we were close friends throughout life, sharing a love of our hometown, medicine, and Cardinals baseball. She encountered loss relatively early in her life when her mother died from breast cancer when Rachel was only 13 years old. She graduated from Brown University, went to Tulane for medical school, where she also received her MPH, and then NYU for internal medicine residency. She then came to UCSF for oncology fellowship during which time she was diagnosed with and ultimately would die from gastric cancer. Her time at UCSF was marked by incredible clinical care of her patients and recognition by her colleagues, uh, her fellows, and the faculty. Our, our careers closely paralleled each other, and we would often talk about how to fit together uh, these passions of global health, oncology, and basic research. She was passionate about global health and caring for the less fortunate. And she was always an intrepid and adventurous traveler, working in China and learning Mandarin. And yet she was entirely grounded in her upbringing, in her roots, in her friendships and family. The only person I knew who could call her, who would call her friends on their birthday without fail. She believed that caring for others was a privilege. And at UCSF, her presence and absence still reverberate to this day. Rachel, facing the adversity of her illness, was incomparably Rachel, incre incredibly positive and spirited. She wanted to let everyone in her life know how much they meant to her. It's best represented in her own words and in her smile. There's a video of her final message online on YouTube, and I encourage you all to watch it. It embodies so much of her spirit. This award was established in Rachel's memory, and I cannot think of a better way to honor her memory today than to present this year's 2023 Rachel Perlin Global Cancer Award to Dr. Yin Ling Wu. Dr. Wu is being honored for her commitment and effort towards reducing inequities in cancer care and making cancer screening accessible to all in geographic regions and strata of society. This year, we would like to make a special mention to one of the 14 nominees for the Perlin Award. We received a post posthumous nomination for Dr. Bongani Kaimila, who passed away, unfortunately, in a fatal car accident in Malawi at the end of 2022. Although this year's awardee, Professor Yinling Wu, the, this agreed that there would be in the spirit of the award to honor the memory of Dr. Kamila for his contributions. Dr. Kamila was an outstanding young researcher devoted to the study of esophageal cancer in his home country of Malawi, committing his career to treating and researching esophageal cancers, of which Malawi has the highest rates in the world. He grew up in Malawi and received his clinical training at the University of Malawi. He then obtained a master's of medical science with a focus on global health and epidemiology at the University of Hokkaido. In 2014, he joined the University of North Carolina project in Lilongwe, which became the research focus as he enrolled in a PhD program at the University of Blantyre. Throughout the years, Dr. Bongani's expertise, commitment, and enthusiasm have ensured sustained collaboration with institutes such as the USNCI and the International Agency for Research on Cancer and the Cancer Research and Control Community will dearly miss him. Now to this year's awardee. Dr. Yinling Wu is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Malaya and a consultant gynecologic oncologist at the University of Malaya Medical Center, Malaysia. She has extensive clinical and research experience that ranges from prevention to treatment of cervical cancer and hereditary familial gynecologic cancers. She completed her specialist and subspecialty training in gynecologic oncology in the UK and was conferred her PhD by Cambridge University for her postdoctoral research on HPV immunobiology. Dr. Wu left Malaysia as a teenager and spent 21 years of education and professional training abroad, 
And in 2010, she returned to Malaysia as a clinician scientist focusing on service development and research programs with an emphasis on gynecologic cancers. As a translational scientist, scientist, she has worked tirelessly to making this knowledge more accessible and applicable to the broader population through her advisory role on policy development nationally and internationally. She also dedicates her time to working closely with other academic institutions, NGOs, and other industries to educate, inform, and advise on matters pertaining to control of HPV-associated diseases. She is a founder of the Rose Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to making cervical cancer prevention accessible and affordable to the underprivileged. And she is deeply committed to making cervical cancer a rare disease in our lifetime. Among her outstanding achievements, she developed and implemented program Rose, an innovative cervical cancer screening program incorporating HPV self-sampling. And in her presentation, we will hear more about this program and the other initiatives that have marked her outstanding career. Dr. Rue, congratulations on your award, and we look forward to your keynote address today. Thank you. So without a further ado, if you allow me to share my slides, I would... Um... Thank you very much. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Okay. So I'd like to thank the ASCGR committee for the honor of delivering this lecture. I want to thank my family, friends, and Malaysians who are staying up at this hour to join me for this talk. When I first found out about Rachel, I Googled and I tried to discover as much as I can about her. And I watched a video that Franklin talked about and her life really moved me and, and she touched me in many ways. I could relate to Rachel in so many, many ways in terms of how she has a bigger global picture for health, but she also looks after patients on a one-to-one -one basis. I heard a story of her drinking barium enema just to prove to the patient that it is safe. And I think these are the doctors that we hope that the future generations will have their heart for patients, both globally as an individual. For me, it's a real honor to, do, to be delivering this lecture, Donald, Sarah. I hope it captures the spirit of Rachel. I thought long and hard about what I was going to say in 20 minutes. How do you capture so much in such a short period of time? So I'm just going to keep it simple and take the advice of James Haggerty, who is, by the way, an obituary writer for the Wall Street Journal. He says the best stories show not just what I've done, but to say why and how. So as you've heard, I've spent a large part of my life overseas and abroad. My undergraduate studies was in Trinity College, Dublin, and my postgraduate training was in the UK. My mentors knew I've always wanted to come back to Malaysia. And despite not, being, not having ever visited Malaysia, they prepared me, they skilled me, and they really gave me what I needed to return to Malaysia. And I thank them for that. So this year marks the 13th year of me working in Malaysia. And in a typical Malaysian way, many would ask me, what do you do? Ah? <laughs> do you teach? Do you see patients? Do you do research? Do you do community work? What do you do? And to that, I answer a bit of everything. And that's given me a perspective of the problems that we are to solve in my homeland. So why? And that's the simplest of all. As I transitioned from being a child to a mother, I observed, I experienced, I've come to appreciate the central role of a woman in a family, I'm not saying that the men are not important. My grandmother, who you see here, brought up eight children pretty much single-handedly. And my mom, well, she's a super mom, and as all mums are. Over the last couple of years, mom has battled cancer courageously and fortunately, she's now well. 
this really brought it close to home how cancer has such a major impact on individuals and families. For me, this personal has experience has reinforced why I do what I do. And so when I look after patients and when I hear their stories, they're not different from me. Their hopes, their fears are similar to women of generations in the past and generations to come. And so the real driver, the why of what I do is to keep women healthy. Malaysia is my home. It has a population of about 33 million and we have a multicultural, multi-ethnic and multi-religious society. We, we are a Commonwealth country that received our independence in 1957. But more than that, for those of you who have visited, you can agree with me that Malaysians are warm. Our food is great, the durian being controversial, and our country is really worth visiting. But this is my Malaysia, a Malaysia that's unlike any other, full of promise and fragility. Its history, culture, and religious diversity makes it rich, compelling, and a surprising land. It is in this Malaysia Program Rose was born. Program Rose has now become synonymous to empowering women towards cervical cancer elimination. For those who don't know what Program Rose is, it really is a comprehensive cervical screening program that reaches out to women in the community so that they can perform their own screening test with a swab, not too different from a COVID test, and then communicating with them through their mobile phones, linking them to care should they have an abnormal test so that the process of screening is complete without even necessarily stepping into a healthcare facility or a hospital. Now, this means a lot to women where going to hospital is a fearful experience or will cost them money. So Program Rose started in 27 as a pilot project, a research project undertaken in UM between University of Malaya and VCS. When the program, pro project ended, it seemed that we couldn't just stop there because it was such an acceptable um, intervention for women. And that's when Program Rose was started. The foundation was started to deliver the program to the underserved population. And subsequently to date, we've screened more than 23,000 women, educated hundreds of thousands of women, and we continue to reach out to women who are under screen. Why Rose? As a gynecological oncologist, it's one of the most common cancers that I encounter at the hospital. It's heart hitting because most of these women are around my age with families. And this really shouldn't happen because ladies and gentlemen, this is the first cancer in the history of humankind that can be eliminated in our lifetime. We have the tools today and we need to use them. And it's a matter of how we use them in our different environments. We have vaccines that work where 90% of our girls should be vaccinated. We need to reach our women and screen at least 70% of them. And if they're screened uh, abnormal, 90% of them should be directed to the appropriate care. So how do we get there? And this is where the how comes in. How do we work towards elimination of cervical cancer in Malaysia? Fortunately, when I returned to Malaysia in 2010, the government had made tremendous effort to initiate a national HPV vaccination program that was fully funded, free for all 13-year-old school-going children. And on an annual basis, more than 80% of girls were vaccinated. Naturally, you would ask, what is the impact of this vaccination program? And so through the sheer determination of one of our PhD students, we've demonstrated very recently that after 10 years of vaccination, the infection rates of HPV in the population among those who have been vaccinated has reduced by more than 90%. 
This means that it would translate to women having a significant reduction of the risk of cancer. But what about those who've not benefited from the vaccine? Adult women like myself, women were just not getting screened effectively. Despite it being free since 1969, less than 20% of women would have had their screening tests done regularly. And this problem is not unique in Malaysia. It's a common situation in lower middle income countries where 80% of the burden of cervical cancer lies. And this is when the innovation of ROSE came in. I wanna put in a disclaimer here. I'm not a trained public health doctor, neither am I an implementation scientist. In 2017, I didn't even know the word implementation science. I used the principles of design thinking, purely trying to put together a program that empathized with the users, the healthcare professionals and the patients, define what the problems were, come up with a solution and to prototype and test. As you can imagine, such an initiative would require multidisciplinary efforts, skills, and thinking. It wasn't just a test we wanted. It wanted I wanted a solution that would ensure that women will complete their screening process and get treated if necessary. Didn't want to come up with a design that has a really perfect protocols because we know protocols and patients may not necessarily align. We can come up with things that do not really um, wasn't convenient to our users. And I was very aware of that. And hence the solution needed to be, to be friendly to our women. Program rules came about during the time where HPV testing was shown to be superior to the conventional pap smear. Using a swab such as this, women were able to take their own samples without requiring an uncomfortable pelvic examination. And as you can imagine, this is a real paradigm shift on how we've always done screening. And so we needed uh, a significant amount of effort to change the practice and to come up with something that is so innovative, new, but evidence-based. How do I convince our collaborators or individuals to join me? The narrative behind the cervical cancer elimination is a compelling story. But as I quote Dr. Bayer, the creator of ER, one of my favorite shows, most people are not data driven. They're driven by stories. Only then can we provide them with data, giving them context, giving them evidence, they need to be moved by the story first. And this was something I learned because I had to speak to financiers, lawyers, um, uh, project managers, talk about business sheets. I, I had to use language to, to get buy-in from uh, telcos and media, really learning how to uh, deliver the cervical cancer elimination story effectively. If you look at the bottom two pictures, you can see at the very start, I even had my, my mom had to edit my speeches, edit some of um, the, the press releases that we were making. And the kids were also quite involved in the um, project. Ethan doesn't know this, but I kept this image because one day I was on the phone uh, having a chat with someone about raising funds about uh, for Project Rose. And at the end of the conversation, he shows me his drawing book. Mom, I know how you can raise funds. This is the plan. You make t-shirts, you advertise, you sell, and perhaps you can set up a stall in the Pasam Malam, which is the night market. So the program was designed with a patient in mind, understanding the steps in which pro patients have to take from one health clinic to the hospital and where the cracks were in the health system to make sure that we make that smooth for each individual woman. 
The entire program is conceptualized and tailored based on local needs. Even the name of the project was thought through on the back of my rough um, paper block. So we need to identify local barriers and come up with local solutions. In designing this problem, it is important that we do not uh, helicopter a solution from an other, another environment into the local environment. In his book, Turning the World Upside Down, I found a few important observations made by Sir Nigel Chris. We may have all the knowledge and scientific data as healthcare professionals and academics, but we may not be able to get patients to do what they need to improve their own health. So if we were to apply, we must be capable of dealing with the uncertainties of trust belief and perception, which is increasingly becoming a major barrier. Remember, people, patients and society versus scientific knowledge and systems. So even as we prototyped and developed the, the interface for the mobile phone, we had to make sure that it was usable and simple. And that was how Program Rose came about in a few minutes. After we came up, came up with a program, we also had a few um, little other steps to take. We developed a laboratory so that the highest standards of uh, HPV testing can be provided to women at the most cost-effective manner. We collaborated with our friends in the then BCS, which is now known as ACPCC, to really accelerate the capacity to test and to use the expertise. We had to, we have to create a foundation in order to execute the program. This is the foundation whereby we could solicit funds so that it could be delivered and given back to the women effectively. Even the sign here was donated by an individual. It really was, Rose really, really was a story of building the trust and relationships with people around us, with stakeholders who believe and still believe in the vision of making cervical cancer rare disease in Malaysia. So Malaysian women you can find are very open to the rose test. They find it acceptable. Self swaps can reach and we have reached a previously underscreened or even unscreened population. And really through our community programs, we've seen many women come in on wheelchairs and have screened themselves for the very first time. We have empowered our frontliners, particularly during the COVID pandemic, to look after themselves, such as the police force and the army. So to date, Program Rose has achieved quite a lot. We've trained many, many volunteers to teach and to, to screen their own communities. We've engaged with more than 90 healthcare professionals, and we still have lots of room to grow. So just to show you a glimpse of what we've done, even in the first year.
ultimately, this is what matters. Women being saved from cervical cancer. And these are just a handful of those who have really benefited from the program. We discovered cervical cancer early and they are now survivors and not victims of the disease. I, I cannot end this talk with just talking about cervical cancer. As a gynecological oncologist, one of the other cancers with many unmet needs is the treatment, screenings and treatment of ovarian cancer. Staying to the theme of collaborative, collaborative partnerships, I want to share two Malaysian-centric effort that I have been part of. One of the major gaps about 10 years ago when I came back um, to Malaysia was the lack of genetic counsellors. Part of the care uh, provided for women with ovarian cancer is to discuss the options of genetic counselling to identify any risk of um, hereditary, cervical, her, hereditary ovarian cancer. So being part of one of the largest collaborative studies led by Cancer Research Malaysia, we determined whether doctors like myself could be involved in the counselling of women on genetic testing. Was there more psychological impact when the, when the counselling was done by a doctor as opposed to counsellor? Really, the findings were very encouraging. This has really been a game changer because my colleagues and I are now able to talk to women, to talk to our patients about genetic counselling as part of their care without causing an increase in psychosocial impact. And more recently, in a very unique effort between patients and their physicians, between my patients and myself, we've joined the Every Woman Study Lower and Middle Income Edition, which involves 24 lower middle income countries, 31 languages, just to establish what the local needs of women with ovarian cancer are and to advocate for them. And this really is a unique, unique study in the sense that patients and doctors are working together for the same cause. And in this initiative, I want to share one story with you in the sense that one of our survivors, the, the late um, Selena Benjamin, established the first ovarian cancer support group in Malaysia. Such initiatives, although starting off as a research program, no matter how small they are, if they are able to enrich a patient's life, it is really worth the effort. So as I end, I want to make a few um, reflections of what um, we, we have achieved so far as a country and as a team. I think I've learned that we need to be courageous in developing culturally appropriate medical in, in interventions. We need collective action. And by that, we need to engage with, with each other through various sectors and through education, financial sectors, and even the media. We need to connect with stories. But most of all, we need to develop and implement patient-centered interventions for patients and their families. We need to teach our next generation of healthcare professionals empathy in care and research. I believe if that's the core of how we drive research, we will actually be very productive in what we do. And countries like Malaysia, this is where I want to make a plea for our country and other lower and middle income countries. We must be able to train, to retain, and to provide a healthcare workforce that will keep our nation healthy. So for those of you who are Malaysians and who are out there not back home, I ask that you consider coming back to help develop this health force. So these are the images of hope and hell that I capture when I'm out in the community. Look at the little fella's hat. It says, I can go anywhere in his mother's arms. So let's ensure that we keep our women healthy for the future generations, for they are the fabric of societies and of the nation. So I thank you once again 
for this award and for the opportunity to share. And lastly, a tribute to the courageous women who have taught me and shared so much with me. And I'd like to echo the words of So Hui. She says, this is not the time to be sad and to lament about our fate, but to fight the disease the best we can. And So Hui, I want to reassure you that we are fighting the best we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof Wu, um, and to me personally, Yin Ling, and I'm going to apologize. I've had tears in my eyes through the whole talk. <laughs> so let me try to regain my composure and just say I've known Yin Ling since 2011 when she welcomed me um, to her home country as a guest and has been an amazing inspiration to me. I remember the day she called me up on the phone and said, Patty, I'm taking a sabbatical. I can't watch another woman die on my table of something that we can prevent. And that was the start of her talking to me about design thinking and about what she was going to do. And it has been so impressive and so amazing. And I am so touched and honored to have her here sharing this work with all of you. I believe at the Center for Global Health, we should give Yin Ling a honorary public health degree because if there was a public health scientist, in the world that I've ever known, I think it is Yin Ling Wu. And I think this has been such an inspiration to all of us, Yin Ling. We really appreciate um, your sharing your stories with us. I think they resonate with everybody who's in this symposium. Um, and you're such a tribute um, to Rachel's work as well. And so I, I hope her family also, I, I can see in the chat that they have really been impressed um, by your carrying on the tradition of, you know, clinician scientists who really care and go out of their way. You and your wonderful team as well, um, many of whom I, I, I've met and, you know, the the ability that you guys have had to keep this going through so many obstacles is truly amazing. So um, I really thank you for that, Yin Ling. Um, I think that um, we don't have time for questions today, but I am sure that Yin Ling would be very happy um, for anybody to contact her with, with uh, you know, for more information. And I know that um, Supe Kouf um, from the program Rose has put uh, a link in the chat. And um, that can tell you a lot about Program Rose. There are a lot of things available on the web. Um, and Yen Li, I just once again want to thank you um, so much for this really impressive work, um, such well-deserved honor that we're happy to bestow on you from NCI. Thank you very much, Patty. Thank you. Nice meeting you, Donal. <laughs> Okay, and um, with that wonderful end to what has been an absolutely fantastic 11th annual symposium on global cancer research. We at CGH really care a lot about this meeting. We're so happy that we're able to virtually bring so many people together. We hope that we can keep growing it. We obviously couldn't do this without so many um, dedicated sponsors that you can see on this slide. Um, this is truly, you know, just in, in keeping with uh, with Yin Ling's talk, um, you know, this takes a community and, and there are a lot of communities that we're working with and trying to um, do what I heard earlier today, which is to, to make this a global kind of effort. And, and I hope that this meeting is really helping to do that. 